way down a rally and way down again. The stock market takes investors on another wild ride. And commodities like oil, iron, and wheat are selling at their lowest prices in years. It's Monday, August 24th, and this is All Things Considered from NPR News. I'm Adi Cornish. And I'm Ari Shapiro. Coming up, economist Austin Goolsby answers your questions about the stock market swings. When's the right time to panic? Never. That's the worst thing that can happen in an environment like this. You will regret the decisions you made in the panic. Later, we'll meet a Chicago chef who runs her own restaurant, even though she's blind. And in our tech segment, the call is coming from, well, not inside the house exactly. This call is supposed to come from a landline in Atlanta, but the audio is telling us it's a Skype phone calling from West Africa. Robocalls and phone fraud. First, these news headlines. From NPR News, this is All Things Considered. I'm Adi Cornish. And I'm Ari Shapiro. Time now for All Tech Considered. Maybe you've had this experience recently. The phone rings. Hello? 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 Nobody's there. Well, actually, there may have been somebody there. If not somebody, at least a computer calling your number and tens of thousands of others to build a list of people to target for theft. Today on All Tech, we're talking about the growing problem of automated phone scams. According to one firm's analysis, they are up 30% in the past year. Here's NPR's Artie Shahani to tell us how they work. Maybe you gave your number to Target or another big retailer that got hacked. Maybe you entered an online raffle to win a free iPhone. In any number of ways, the criminal ring gets your 10 digits, loads them into an automated system, and that initial call you get with silence on the other end? That's essentially the first of the reconnaissance calls that these fraudsters do. They're trying to see, are they getting a human on the other end? Vijay Bala Subramanian is CEO of Pindrop Security, a company in Atlanta that detects phone fraud. You even cough and it knows you're there. The next step is gathering information about your bank or credit card account. You get this call. Calling with an important message regarding your debit card. If you are the card holder, please stay on the line and press 1. Otherwise, please have the card holder call us at 1. If you're thinking about ignoring it, the message tries to scare you into paying attention. A temporary hold may have been placed on your account and will be removed upon verification of activity. Again, that number is 1. That number leads to another automated system that prompts you to share personal details like your date of birth, your card number and secure PIN, the expiration date, your social security number. It can be tricky because many real banks have a similar system. And Bala Subramanian says fear does kick in. He recalls one big scam. Or we last year had this IRS call where they were saying, you owe back taxes. If you wanted to call back or have time to talk to your spouse before paying over the phone, the fraudster wouldn't let you go. They're like, okay, if you want a moment to process this, We're going to send the law enforcement in front of your doorstep. There's also a very interesting detail about this 1877 number. If you call back from your phone, which the criminal dialed, you get the prompt. If you call back from somewhere else, you get... This number has been deactivated. So a regulator or police officer that's trying to crack down will think incorrectly it's out of commission. Banks and credit card companies hire Pindrop to help them detect fraud. Here's a real-life example provided by one call center. It starts with the operator. I apologize. I'm having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. Are you, are you on a, like a... I'd like, no, I'd like you to... Uh, I do know the available credit my account. Got it. The caller, who is pretending to be the account holder, wants to know his available credit to make sure the account is worth pursuing. Your available credit is $34,999. $34,999? Yeah, $34,999. That's good money. Okay, um, could you help me up with my main address today? Update your address? The caller proceeds to take over the account. Now, there are clues that the guy calling isn't legit. Listen again to the quality of his voice. No, I'd like you to uh, I do know the available credit my account. Internet-based phone services divide your voice into little packets, wrap them up, and ship them across the network. If a packet gets lost, you get a break in the audio. The size of the break varies by country, by network conditions, the specific device you use, Samsung Galaxy, MacBook Air... 
and the voice itself. These all give additional clues. Pindrop has a tool that puts about 147 clues together and rates how trustworthy the caller is in real time, so an operator can tell. This call is supposed to come from a landline in Atlanta, but the audio is telling us it's a Skype phone calling from West Africa. There's no similar tool available for the average person. Bala Subramanian says your best bet is to make sure the number you're calling matches the number on the back of your credit card or debit card or the company's website. Arthi Shahani, NPR News, San Francisco. And the Federal Trade Commission is trying to combat the rising number of illegal automated phone calls. Patty Shu is an attorney at the FTC who, who leads that effort. Welcome to the program. Thank you very much for having me. So we heard a little bit about the specifics of how these calls work, but how big is the problem? Can you put a number on the scale of robocalls like this? Sure. It's a huge problem from the Federal Trade Commission's perspective. It is the number one consumer complaint that we receive. On average, we receive about 170,000 complaints every single month about robocalls. And we mentioned criminal rings in that story. Do you have any specifics? Are there specific countries or do you have any more details about the criminals uh, who are behind this? I think from our law enforcement perspective, the calls are coming from anywhere in the world. Um, We do have certain countries that tend to be more prevalent than others. But the reality is, with technology being the way it is, it's very easy to send the calls from anywhere. And we do have a number of scammers that also come from the U.S. as well, which is where um, we have been able to do fairly effective law enforcement. It seems like the technology is really advanced here. I mean, what is the government doing to try and combat the rising number of these calls? We are challenging the public to help create products that allow consumers to protect themselves from these bad actors. In our last challenge, Robocalls Humanity Strikes Back, we asked uh, the contestants to build something that allows consumers to block the calls on their phones and allows them to forward it to a uh, crowdsource honeypot. Um, So it's it's crowdsourcing the uh, robocalling information. Now, you may ask, why is that last part so important, the the call forwarding to a crowdsourced honeypot? Um, And for us, from a law enforcement perspective, getting that data on those robocallers is actually very useful for our law enforcement efforts. And you called it a crowdsourced honeypot. Yes, I'm calling it a crowdsourced honeypot because essentially it means that the consumers can send us their robocalls. Essentially, consumers send you copies of the calls, and then you look for clues within those calls to figure out where they might be coming from, what industries might be using them, and who their customer targets are. Potentially. They're all, all things that we, that we hope um, will be useful, but and, until we actually implement it, you know, the sky's the limit at this point. So if you get a call that sounds like fraud, and let's say uh, you don't get it together to send it to the honeypot, what should you do with that call? I mean, is, is there, do you just hang up? How do you handle it? Yes, our number one consumer tip for robo, uh, for consumers in terms of dealing with robocalls is to just hang up. Uh, we don't want consumers to engage in any way with the uh, robocallers. Um, a lot of times when you get a robocall, you have the option of pressing one for more information or pressing two to ask uh, to be removed from the list. And in either case, um, Pressing one or two basically lets the robocaller know that it's a live person on the other line who's willing to engage, and that could lead to additional robocalls. So our number one tip is just hang up. Patty Shu, she's an attorney with the Bureau of Consumer Protection at the FTC. Thank you so much for speaking with us. Thank you.